Sui Tan is the program manager with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, uh, which is the local MPO in the San Francisco Bay Area. Bay Area. There are 109 local jurisdictions in that MPO. All 109 use the same pavement management program. I hope I'm not stealing your thunder. It's a greatly, you know, it's a well used, greatly utilized, great pavement management system that, that they've developed and used. So we, you've been doing this a long time, I think about 20, 25 years. Actually, uh, the first time I went to Washington, D.C., I was working for the city of Aurora, Colorado, as a pavement management engineer for Aurora. And I went back and I met some of your predecessors, Paul and Margot Yap, who still works with you. And at that time, the system was called BAMS, the Bay Area Management System. So a little bit about marketing and, and telling the message better, Street Saver, is a little better name than BAM, BAM, BAM. You know, I think of the Flintstones. That's my age. Sorry, you guys. Um, so, SWE's been doing this for 25 years uh, as a registered civil engineer specializing in asset management, streets, highways, and bridges. He's implemented many, many pavement management systems using the Street Saver software uh, for cities and counties in the U.S. His work includes data quality management, performing investment analysis, presenting results to decision makers, and more. He regularly lectures at universities, teaches workshops, and organizes Street Saver uh, user conferences. Sui's co-authored research papers that emphasize effective use of PMS and pavement preservation in a, integration. Um, I, it, I, I hope you'll hear today about some of the, another way we can be using that. And so please welcome Sui. Good afternoon. Um, again, my name is Sui Tan. Thank you very much for showing up. I know it's late. Um, and then without further ado, let me get into what I'm um, going to talk about. So um, as um, Steve was talking about, you know, having a pavement management um, system in place, it really is, helps you to make other decisions that you never thought, thought about being able to do. So today's topics that I'm going to be kind of linking the two together will be on how we uh, help to solve some of the, the issues with uh, the ADA uh, RAMS um, situations. So here's the problem. Um, since July 8, 2013, um, there's a joint technical assistant um, uh, rule uh, was published and then making that uh, everyone that has um, uh, ADA RAM that's not in compliance when you're doing um, some kind of treatments to your roads, especially they say that it's the alterations that you need to make sure that your ADA RAMs get into in compliance. So what's that means uh, for the alteration part of it? So a little bit on the definitions. So um, for treatments that they consider as maintenance, um, the one that's uh, listed up there on, on, on the, as the tables, those are your typical, you know, pavement preservations, uh, treatment strategies that you have been hearing today, yesterday, today, and, and probably tomorrow as well. As well as seeing them on the, in the field uh, demo yesterday. Um, but one thing that is uh, kind of weird for a lot of just engineers like us is that um, in this um, Title II, uh, rulemaking by the DOJ, Department of uh, the Justice, um, they say that out of all these um, alterations right here, um, of course, we know overlay um, reconstructions, um, in, in place as for recycling, those, you know, you're really kind of giving a new life to the pavement. So it's okay, we, we understand that. So when we're doing this kind of treatments, then we need to bring those ADA RAMs into compliance. But what's really trick, um, trip on a lot of us was that um, now microsurfacing capsules uh, are all being considered as uh, alteration. So that becomes a problem because we do a lot of this type of treatments at the pavement preservation um, level. So um, with that, really, um, a lot of the agencies are uh, kind of stuck like, should we go, should we do, continue to do what we do, or should we change strategies? 
So we'll just kind of give you a little bit of background on um, ADA RAMs, right? ADA RAMs is not, a, it's not cheap, okay? Now, when you try to bring up um, the ADA RAMs into compliance, and, or, or if you don't have any ADA RAMs at all at the street corners, at the rural area, small towns, it might cost you $4,000 just to do that. But if you are in San Francisco, I mean, it could go up to $10,000 just to put in your four corners ADA RAMs. Um, of course, you know, in San Francisco, they might have more utilities, they have to relocate. And then, and then you just kind of, you know, cross your fingers that when you're digging it down, you're not triggering any of the section 106 archeology span studies that you have to do. And then, and then for your NEPA clearance, and that might get stuck. So there's a lot of this um, things might, might get, throw you a curveball when you're trying to, you know, do your, uh, ADA RAMs. So, knowing that the cost is expensive, so what do we do as smart engineers, right? Initially, this is what we do. So we avoid it, right? <laughs> we avoid it, but avoid it as far as we can, as long as we can. So, some of the smarter ones, they start changing the name, microsurfacing, well, I just call it polymer modified surly seal, so I can get by with it. Okay, or um, this is probably the, one of the worst offenders would be like, okay, from now on, we're not longer gonna do microsurfacing, okay? We're gonna do surface seal. But you know, from your payment management system, it's really recommending you to do microsurfacing because you know that that's gonna give you that extended service life very cost effectively. So, but now you start to change the ways that you're doing business. Or the other one, they didn't see it, they didn't hear it, the business as usual, just go ahead and, and, you know, until we get caught, all right? Others, um, you know, especially for a lot of the local agencies, I mean, we all have transition, ADA transition plans. I know there are some that have been, that have done it 10 years, 15 years ago, but seriously, I don't know how many actually uh, look, going back and look into the transition plan and see, well, how many have we done? How many of these ADA RAMs that, that have obstructions that we have cleared? That have, we have continued to work on it. Um, you know, I'm saying some, maybe a few, maybe just doing kind of a, a lip service because this is required by the law, okay? So, well, if we avoid it long enough and uh, Here's some of the couple of examples. Caltrans, same thing. They avoid it and, and kind of ignoring it. And finally, the loss in the lawsuit, and now they're stuck with the $1.1 billion uh, lawsuit that for the next 30 years, they need to get the ADA RAMs into compliance. So now, in where I live in Fremont, California, there's the 238, state highway, but it's kind of run through the cities. There's no sidewalks, but I see ADA ramps. You get it? No sidewalks, but they have ADA ramps. All right? So that's, I was like, what's, what's the point? There's no sidewalk, why do you put an ADA ramp there? Well, because they are required. If they don't do it, you know, DOJ is gonna come down with it and then find them some more. City of Sacramento, same thing, right? They, they lost, and now with their budgets, every year they have to put 20% of their budget into making sure that they are meeting compliance for the ADA curb ramps. So the question for you guys is, are you guys doing it, avoiding it? Or are you really take out your ADA RAMs, brush it up, freshen it up, and start looking at it and see what you had to do? So I think for many of us, it's not just like, you know, well, yeah, sure, let's go get it and, and let's start doing it, all right? But there's a lot of issues that's, that's circling around, you know, how are you gonna get your ADA RAMs into compliance? So, I mean, first and foremost is that 
well, you know, we have been doing, you know, say for example, microsurfacing, and and it's like twenty dollars a square yard, for example. And on this unit cost that I'm that I'm quoting here is probably like San Francisco unit cost. Other region maybe a little bit cheaper, but let's say it's twenty dollars a square yard, okay. And when you try to factor in your ADA RAMs, all of a sudden, it's your twenty dollars doesn't go that far anymore. That you might have to start ch thinking about, wow, what are we going to do? Are we, are we, am I gonna, should we be shortening the project limits? Because these ADA RAMs start start eating into your cost. I mean, a lot of them is like thirty to forty, thirty to forty percent more. So it, that become a, a very a tricky issues on, on you know how do you actually going to do it? You want to do it, but you don't have the money to do it. And others is like, well, gee, we're just going to delay until we got enough money to do it. Okay. Now you know that that's what we have been preaching right here, right? Doing the right treatment at the right time and the right place. So. In this case, you know, your time is not there anymore. So that's not good either. And then others are saying, well, you know, since I don't know when I'm going to do the ADA RAMs, so they think it's the smartest route and say, well, okay, well, rather than $20 a square yard, I'm going to factor in the, doing the ADA RAMs, and that adds another $20. So now the unit cost becomes $40 a square yard. Okay, they put it into the decision trees and then run the analysis that way. Well, the only problem with that is really not all location that needs your ADA RAMs upgrade, right? You have maybe a lot of them are already in compliance. So you're just kind of doing a broad brush type network wise kind of planning. You might, you know, um, inflating your maintenance needs. And, and the other issue is that um, where I see there's probably more collaborations needed so, is that some folks are saying, well, you know, we're only handling the paving side of it, okay? Um, ADA RAM, that's another department. So they, they'll figure out what they're going to do with it and just kind of sweep it under the rock. So what I'm hoping then is f having a pavement management system, there's a solution. Okay? There's a solution that we can help to, to, to bridge that gap. What we're going to do is to build the ADA RAMs into, a com in, into compliancy with your long-term capital improvement plans. Okay? Now we do capital improvement plans or your maintenance plan every you know, three, maybe to up to six years. And then you do updates you know, every two years or so, right? So if you can think about you know, looking at a little bit ahead, so when you have this type of treatments and you can plan ahead and factor the cost of what are the ADRMs that you need to be doing, then hopefully it would not be a sticker shock to you when you need to, you know, when you go out and, and wanted to fix a certain part of the roads with, you know, microsurfacing with capsule, okay, because you know that you're already kind of factoring it in there. So that's where the asset management approach comes in um, because we all have a paper management system. Just by a show of hand, how many of you here doesn't have a paper management system in your agency? Okay, there shouldn't be any hands that's, that's going up because <laughs> we are all doing payment preservation. As Steve was saying, it's an integral part of your payment preservation program with your payment management system. So with that, we know all our payment needs, payment maintenance needs, okay? So now if we can put that ADA RAMs, the assets, into your payment management system and keep track of it, monitoring it, then you'll be able to access your maintenance needs for ADA RAMs, right? So that's kind of the basis of what we're trying to do um, of using the asset management approach to build that ADA RAMs in there, okay? 
So some of the benefits. So with that, now suddenly the ADA transition plan that's sitting on the shelf collecting dust, suddenly you put that into motion already. Okay, because you have the active plans to remove whatever the obstacles that's being specified in that plan, and then you are constantly working on it. So from the liability side of it, then you know you are okay because if they come and audit you and say, Yeah, we, we have the plan, we'll continue working on it. Here is what we have done. Right? You're showing them. Versus the one that's like, oh, where's our plan? I, the, you know, the one that we did in 2005, and it's like, wow, that's 10 years ago now. W can you find a plan? All right. Now, with that, also, uh, the benefits um, is also that you imp improve the safety. Okay. Now, I know for a lot of the urban agencies, uh, this is one of the the very important issues with um, the the bike and the path. Um, you know, having, um, especially for pedestrian, uh, having and the disabilities, having a ADA ramps um, definitely uh, will make a better mobility for a lot of the folks to enjoy. Um, let me just tell you a story. I, I was in, in Malaysia last uh, two months ago, okay, those are the annual vacations. So when I was there, uh, of course, you know, knowing that I'm going to be giving a topic on this, and I will start looking at what kind of ADA ramps they have over there. And lo and behold, I didn't see any ADA ramps at all. I mean, in, third, you know, I mean, developing countries, it makes me feel like we, uh, we are so fortunate to be here that we are actually taking care of the, the disability needs for a lot of the people that, that could not get out of the house in Malaysia. I mean, how are they gonna enjoy life you know, without, they, they might have a, a wheelchair, but there's no way they can go. So, and then I touches on the, a little bit on the, the financial liabilities, um, because now that you are actively keeping track of it, um, that make it harder for the regulatories to come in and audit you and saying that you didn't do your job. You got a plan, but you didn't do anything to it. Okay? And that's kind of what happens to Sacramento because they do have the plans, but it's just that they're not doing it, anything on it. Okay? And of course, now, when you have a plan, then that also helps you to organize, to, to build together. You could have done a citywide ADA RAMS. Okay, now the Fed will pay for it because this is safety now. When you talk about safety, it, you know, that's, that is something that's important. That you can get that 10% set aside funding, STP funds, to pay for a citywide type of uh, ADA ramps upgrade if you choose to, to do that. Okay, now in our regions, there, there, there were a couple agencies that did that. <coughs> so um, now let me do a, a, a a case study. So, city of Los uh, Altos. Uh, it's, um, it's kind of semi-rural neighborhood. Okay, but it's kind of influence, uh, affluent neighborhood too in 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 the San Francisco Bay Area. There, um, small, 110 miles, um, good pavement condition. PCI 75. Okay, so they've been using managed, like Steve was saying, in all 109 agencies in Bay Area, all use street saver to manage their pavement. So, um, because they already have the system in place, when they hire consultants to go out and do their ADA RAMs um, uh, updates, this is the transition plans, you can take advantage of that. While doing it, having them collect the data and put it into like, you know, Excel file or, or GIS, these days probably end up in the GIS shape files for you, okay? So by, by the end of it, so of course, they'll t tells you, you know, which are the one that, that you are in compliance, which are the ones that are not in compliance, um, and, what are, and depending on how much money you have, it really, for data collections, um, it gets to be expensive when you're trying to ask for condition as well. If you are not in compliance, what are the ones that fail? You know, you, you, you don't have that 2% flare, or the, the, or the 8%, or 833 or, you know, the slope is not, the cold slope is not there. 
or you don't have that four foot um, landing pad there. So it gets to be more expensive when you ask for more, but if you're just saying that, okay, well, tell me whether this is compliant or not compliant, then there might be a d different story. So the end of the story is that, so the consultants go out and collect the data for them. This is just inventory, okay? The inventory is information with just a yes or no, they are in compliant or not in compliant for the ADA RAMs. So it's, it's much cheaper. So when they put that information into Street Saver Plus and then through the GIS uh, shape files, so now we have all the conditions in there. So in their decision trees, of course, they have microsurfacing in there, they have rehab, they have you know, reconstructions, and as well <laughs> as um, I don't think they have capsule for in this case here because it's you know urban and then they're oh no no they do have capsule but they don't have chip seal. So, but in that case, because all these treatments will, it's considered alterations, right? So, in the decision trees, it's already, um, because it's built into street safe itself, the paper management system, so it automatically go and check whether or not this is already in compliance. If not, then what are the locations that we are calling out for microsurfacing? If, and then get those costs, additional costs that need to bring those ADRMs into compliance. So now, your cost is more localized now because you only factor in whichever, you know, on the locations where you need to get your ADM into compliance and versus uh, a unique cost, a broad-based wise type you know, of, um, of planning or estimation. So that really helps them in narrowing down what is their um, the ADA compliance cost. So, and then at the same time, now, no longer they have a, um, an ADA plans that, that it's sitting on the shelf, but now they, they virtually get that plans working again, because they already kind of put that into the system and being actively t keeping track of it. Okay. So just a little bit on, on what they do, you know, as far as like, which one uh, is more important to fix so of course, the one that's come, come out from the capital improvement program, they already have funding to do it, so they'll do that first, and then, they, they, um, and then they'll do other kind of ranking process to see which one they want to do. Now, by all means, this is not like you know, the only standards because it's kind of various by agencies, by locations, by different geographic regions, and whether or not you're in urban, rural area. So this is just some, some of the, the ranking, the, the, some of the factors they look into it when they're doing their um, uh, selection process. So capital improvement program, of course, this is the first one that they will do because there's funding, and then they also look at you know, whether this um, ADA RAM is close to any pedestrian generators. By, what I mean by that is, you know, as a lot of your central business districts, there's a lot of pedestrians, so that might be a, you know, a higher priority than, than other area or area that have safety issues where you have pedestrian, pedestrian uh, fatalities, um, that sort of things that, that have happened before. Or um, other places where uh, you have the non-compliance in intersections. So uh, because I know a lot of agencies, you probably already have some kind of REM in place already, you know, after 1992. So, so that might be still okay um, but of course not according to the, the latest standards. And also uh, area where you have um, the elderly and, uh, and disabled, you know, near the hospital, nursing homes, as well as school. So there are, there are agencies that, that focus on safe route to school. So that, those are the area that may have higher priority than, than other area. So that's kind of in a nutshell that I, I, I want to, you know, kind of bring the awareness to you that we have the solution. We can think about how to solve these issues. Um, we shouldn't be avoiding it. And we sh shouldn't be even changing our strategies. And we can still be able to maintain uh, the assets, the, the ADA RAMs, and you know, make the, the best use of it and, and to serve the communities. So with that, that's it. Questions?
Any questions for SWE? So the, the question is, where did the individual estimates for the ADA improvements come originally come from? The original ADA improvement, you mean the cost, the unit cost for each of the? Yeah, for once you had everything entered into the system, you had ramps and added to projects and at 2,000 here. You said some of them range from two to 10,000. I was really curious how variable you thought those estimates were. Sure. Yeah, those are some of the estimates, um, depending on your locations. Um, so there, there are situations where um, in, in the decision trees, you could have like, you know, half of the intersection that needs to be upgraded and versus all four corners that need to be updated and as well as um, the cost. So the cost, I've seen cost in some regions, only $2,000 all the way to three, $4,000. So that's kind of the rough estimate. That's more for network level type of um, planning. Yeah, removal and replacement isn't cheap, right? Pat? So we, uh, our, our cost of that was about $3,500 a quarter. Yeah. So the, he said that the cost in Denver, uh, and Pat manages that program for the city and county of Denver, it's about $3,500 per ramp per corner. Per corner. Per, per corner. corner. So, and, and, and if you had to do all four, it. Yeah, you're looking at yeah, thirteen, thirteen yeah. to fifteen thousand. So um, that's quite a bit. You know, when I when I was pavement management engineer for the city of Aurora, the the ruling was coming down, and uh, we knew we had twenty thousand intersections. City of Aurora, if you don't know, is the third largest city in Colorado. At the time, it was the sixty seventh largest city in the United States. So it's a large, large city, and we, so we had about twenty thousand intersections, and we figured that the impact way back then was about a $45 million impact that we didn't have anywhere close to that money. But like Sui said, you have to have a transition plan and be working towards achieving the mobility that all the citizens need, need to have. But I'll tell you, it doesn't do any good for, uh, for anybody if your road system falls apart, right? So nobody, if nobody can get around, that doesn't really help the, the people who are challenged, physically challenged and need the ramps. Um, if nobody gets around. So we, we need to make sure everybody can get around, which requires pavement preservation and a good pavement management program. So, um, you know, but we can't ignore that segment of the population and that's what the mm -hmm. law is all about. That's gotta, gotta be done. Um, but I would beg you guys not to take it out of your preservation budget. You know, if there's other capital improvements that need to be made, that's where that money comes from, not from, as Jean-Francois Corte said the other day, it, failing to actually fund maintenance and preservation is a disinvestment in your system. Mm -hmm. right. Other questions? Sir. So if you're in a neighborhood that has no sidewalks at all, do you have to put in? You know, they, yes, Sui said that he had seen that happen, and I, I think that can happen. I don't know that that is a federal requirement. I don't think it is. Pat, you, you have yeah, the answer? I mean, given that we just got through all sorts of litigation. Okay. Uh, ADA law, our attorneys have looked at this inside out, states that if they're, if you're altering the street, and SWE gave all those, the treatments that trigger alterations, if you alter a street and there is a maintained sidewalk, which could be any number of different products, that could be a crusher fines all the way up to standard five foot wide concrete sidewalk. If there is a maintained sidewalk, then a ramp needs to go in. If there is no maintained sidewalk, then a ramp is not required. So if it's just a pedestrian path where people have, have just pioneered not, in, yeah, pioneered in the path, you don't have to worry about it. You know, and, and I apologize for not answering that question directly. There's a lot of litigation that's gone on, and you know, as a former Fed, I had to deal with some of that. But that's been a, it's been more than two years since I retired, so I'm really careful about what I say for something so litigious as as this this particular topic. It's a huge dollar topic when you're yeah. talking, you know, $1.1 billion settlements for the state of California. $1.1. Whenever you talk billions, you get my attention. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Any other questions for Sui? Sir. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much.